Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Denise Milne, and I uh, co-chair the Cross Ministry Committee on FASD, and uh, I'm also a senior manager with Children and Youth Services, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Christine. So welcome, and thank you for attending today's session with Christine Anderson and her famous colleague Pippin on animal-assisted therapy with uh, clients with FASD. Before I introduce I Christine and Pippin formally, there's a few housekeeping tips we need to go over. All sites have been muted at the bridge. Uh, but please ensure that your mics are actually muted. If you experience any difficult, uh, technical difficulties, please let your uh, local site coordinator know and they will follow up accordingly. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, you can text Aaron Day at 780-405-3376 or you can also email Aaron at aaron.day at gov.ab.ca. Again, her text number is 780-405-3376. Um, also, if you have any questions for, for Christine after the session, her contact information will be located at the end of her slides. And you already have her slides uh, to begin with, so you'll find it there. Um, also, it's really important that you fill out the evaluations. Um, they will be emailed to you uh, after the session. And also, the last thing in housekeeping is just please ensure you sign in on the attendance sheets. So we're pleased to um, have today's session. Um, there are about 18 sites attending, Christine and Pepin. Um, there are 13 participants at our live site and many more uh, participants at the various sites. As you know, education and training is a huge and critical uh, strategy within the uh, government of Alberta's 10-year strategic plan on FASD. And so the FASD Learning Series is one um, option that we have explored over the past couple of years in terms of getting education and training out to uh, service providers, foster parents, parents, uh, professionals in the field of FASD. And so we're pleased to keep these sessions going. So, your participation is going to be really helpful at this site because you're one of the facilitated sites here. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Christine. Um, I've known Christine for a couple of years now, uh, but Christine has a master's um, in arts and she's a uh, registered provisional psychologist and she specializes in animal assisted therapy. She's worked with the CHIMO project for a number of years and that organization helps individuals and institutions implement an animal assisted therapy program. Uh, Christine also uh, authored the book Pause on Purpose Implementing an AAT Program for Children and Youth including those with FASD and Developmental Disabilities. We've really strongly supported this program through the Cross Ministry Committee because we believe this is a, an innovative way to deal with children with FASD. Christine's currently operating a private practice in psychology called Anderson Animal Assisted Counseling. She's presented at a number of conferences and most recently at our conference here in Edmonton and was one of the top presenters. Uh, she has two therapy dogs and one therapy horse. would like to meet the horse because I think that's another viable project. Um, her colleague Pippin, who uh, you will see on the screen shortly, is a five-year-old Shetland sheepdog who is a certified therapy animal with the Chimo Project. Pippin loves doing tricks, we've seen a number of those this afternoon, being cuddled and would sell his soul for a hot dog. So please join me in welcome Christine and Pippin. Yeah, and this is Pippin and he, he really would sell his soul for a hot dog, that's, that's not a joke, I think it's an offer. Um, so basically what I'm here to talk, to, um, talk about today is animal assisted therapy for use with clients with FASD. And basically it's to take a therapy modality, just like play therapy or sand therapy or any of the other therapy modalities, and use it to help your clients achieve their goals. That's as simple as it is. And Pippin's here to help and possibly find some crumbs on the floor. So, you gonna lie down? Lie down. No one wants to see your butt, buddy. There we go. Lie down. Pippin is an excellent therapy dog, not because, lie down, not because he's perfect, but because of some of his imperfections, when you have to tell him, keep lying down, for kids that's really good work with frustration tolerance. We use this dog a lot for frustration tolerance. Um, for things like, you know, lie down. Yes, I mean it. Yes, I still mean it. Yes, even right now. So that's some of the things we do. So what is animal assisted therapy? I mean, if I had a quarter for every time I told someone I'm an animal assisted therapy um, counselor, and they said, my dog barks at the door every time someone runs by. How do I stop that? And I go, no, no, I don't do therapy on the animals. 
So the first thing I always do is talk about a definition of what is animal assisted therapy. It's a goal directed intervention that, and the animal is a structured, an integral part of the structured treatment. What that means, it's not just bringing your dog to work and having them lay on the floor, it's using the animal strategically to help your clients. Um, so it's delivered by a professional service provider, such as a recreation therapist, a clinical social worker. Um, so it's not something that's done by volunteers. There's pet therapy where volunteers come in and do it, but animal assisted therapy is specifically organized by a professional. It's designed to promote improvements in physical, emotional, social, or cognitive functioning. And it's documented and evaluated. So what that means is that there are a lot of different ways that animal assisted therapy can help. It can work with physical goals. It can work with emotional goals. It can work with cognitive goals. For one of my favorites for the physical goals is we had a, a young gentleman in a gym class who absolutely refused to be part of any kind of physical activity. And that was one of his major problems is that he needed more physical activity. And so he said, nope, not doing gym class, forget it. And we had the therapy dog there for a half day at the school. And, uh, and we said, okay, no, no fitness, nothing for you like that. How about you just take the therapy dog for a walk? Because he's getting really bored just watching you guys all do gym class. He said, okay, I'll take the therapy dog for a walk, but I'm not getting exercise. Okay. So, um, so we had him take the therapy dog for a walk. He was able to attain some of his physical goals. And also, it's documented and evaluated which means that you're actually keeping track of how is it going and how can we improve it in the future. Animal assisted therapy is not a fix all, it does not work for everyone, it doesn't work for every client base, it doesn't work for every problem. So if you document it and evaluate it, you can see with your clients, with your population, what works really well and you should do again in the future and what was a good idea at the time but doesn't really work at your facility. So. A lot of times we'll talk about animal assisted therapy and people will say, well really, but with FASD clients, isn't that a bad fit? And we find that actually it ends up being a really good fit because um, one of the things we've seen from our clients with FASD that we've worked with is that they seem to work really well with animals. They seem to connect. Animals have this nonverbal quality about how they interact. They're not demanding. They're not asking. They're not prodding. They're participating nonverbally in an inviting manner. So we find that a lot of our clients with FASD actually really enjoy interacting with the animals. And also, um, it basically, working with animals gives an opportunity for professionals to apply the principles of working with kids with FASD. We're not reinventing the wheel here. These are not brand new principles. These are not brand new things. It's just using the animal to help in the intervention in a positive environment. When you're working with the animal, it gets to be a positive thing instead of a negative thing. So, next one. So, what is not animal assisted therapy? We talked briefly about pet visitation. And that's where volunteers will go to uh, elderly care homes and have the pets visit. It's got some benefits, but it's not animal assisted therapy, not what we're talking about. There's animal assisted activities, which is basically no goals. That's, well, we'll bring the animal in and see what happens. So again, that's not what we're talking about here. And also pet ownership. Pet ownership can be very valuable, but it's not what we're talking about. And so animal assisted therapy, strategic, done by a professional. That's what we're looking for when we're doing animal therapy. Next slide. So a lot of people say, well, who can do animal assisted therapy? Um, obviously, the animals can't do it by themselves. So they need some help from some therapists. And we've probably trained about two dozen different kinds of therapists at the Chimo Project to work with animals. It's really been amazing for the, uh, for the, for the variety that we've been able to work with. It's been really cool. Um, we've worked with psychologists, we've worked with psychiatrists, child and youth care workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, recreation therapists, mental health nurses, speech language pathologists, school counselors, teachers, teaching aides, crisis counselors, frontline workers, respite care workers, social workers. So I mean, it basically, if you are a professional that works with clients and you have goals that you're trying to help those clients work towards, we can find a way to make animal assisted therapy work with you too. So, what kinds of animals can be used with animal assisted therapy? Um, first, any questions about the definition of animal assisted therapy, what it is, what it isn't, anything like that? I'm gonna let Pippin go to go see if there are any hot dogs on the floor. Okay, buddy, off you go. No questions, great. Okay, so, in terms of the different kinds of animals that we can use in animal assisted therapy, um, the first one is cats. We find there aren't a whole lot of cats that are appropriate therapy choices as therapy animals, but the cats that we've worked with have been amazing and they've done really great work with clients. 
that cat in the picture there, it's actually working, uh, that's Dr. Natasha Sherbo, who worked uh, at, a, uh, at a residential facility, worked with lots of kids with FAS, and her cat's name is Rupert, and he's a real sweetheart. And some of the things that cats can do, they're great at teaching boundaries, because cats have this magical way of not respecting your boundaries at all. If they want to come and sit on your lap, they're going to come and sit on your lap, regardless of any cues you may or be giving off. And then inversely, when you try and pet a cat, say, on its paws, on its tail, somewhere it doesn't like, the cat's going to let you know that, hey, that's not cool. So it's a really nice mirror for a lot of the parental relationships that these kids are coming from, of going, I don't respect your boundaries, and I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, but whoa, I've got boundaries. So they are a really nice mirror for some of the difficulties you're seeing with the kids coming in. So with cats, we work on some of the boundary stuff of going, you know what, no, I'm not comfortable having you on my lap. I'm going to set you next to me instead of having you right on my lap. Or working with the cats and going, this is what a boundary is, because sometimes kids can't figure out why no one's their friend. And it's because other kids will put up boundaries and be like, oh, okay, well, let's just stop a second. And they just keep right on trucking. And with cats, it's really good that way, because if you try and pet a therapy cat's feet or something it doesn't like, it'll just run off and go jump on top of something tall. And so you can go, okay, well, let's look at this. How is the cat saying that your, its boundaries are being violated? What did that look like? How can we change our behavior in the future so that we can make this work? So cats provide a really neat kind of thing for working with boundaries. Um, cats are great to comfort clients, especially those cats that are heat-seeking lap seekers that just love being petted. They're really, really good for comforting. Um, great for fine motor skills, brushing, giving them treats, clicking a leash on their collar. Um, and also they're not as intimidating as dogs. Some clients, dogs are a little bit too much, even small dogs, and some clients prefer cats to dogs. Um, another type of animal that we can work with is uh, rabbits. Oddly enough, we found that rabbits actually make fantastic therapy animals. They are second to none to calm, providing that calming influence. Um, and how we stumbled on this actually is we found there's a hospital in Israel that actually has a petting zoo on the third floor and the therapists who are certified can actually take their cards and go check animals out of the petting zoo. Yeah. Um, they have cats, they have a little dog, they have goats, they have sheep, little sheep, and uh, chickens, ducks, and rabbits. And so the therapist can go check the animals out. And so what they found is, is that a lot of times when they were working with these kids who had been traumatized, you know, your school bus has been blown up, your parents have been killed, they come in highly anxious. And they found that they could either give them the drugs, Clonix and Fergan, to calm them down, or they also found out that the rabbits had almost the exact same effect on the kids when you put a rabbit on their lap to the point that they actually named the rabbits Clonix and Fergan. So that's the, the magnitude of, uh, of the calming effect that rabbits can have. Um, another animal that can be used that we've, uh, we've certified is actually birds. There is a uh, Edmonton psychiatrist who is using a Goffin's cockatoo with his clients. It's an amazing little bird, and it works really well with his clients. And they've actually done studies that have shown that birds are able to connect for some reason to individuals with disordered thinking. So if you're having trouble with your thought patterns, especially those uh, who are showing schizophrenic thought patterns, they found that even just having birds in the room during group therapy sessions helped to calm them and helped improve their function. So birds are another one. Uh, there's also horses. Uh, that's a picture of a miniature horse named uh, um, Shanti, who goes to the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital to the walking group. Uh, their goals was to increase participation in the walking group. It's 9 a.m. every morning and you do laps of the basement. I can't imagine why they have trouble getting people down there. Um, so what we do is that we have the, uh, the miniature horse go down there and whoever's done the most laps that month gets to take the miniature horse for a few laps. So they grab him by his little lead rope and they lead that horse all around. And an interesting effect that we found is they actually found that the, um, having the mini horse involved actually increased participation not only of the patients, but also the therapists wanted to come and bring more patients because they wanted to see the mini horse. So they found that participation went exponentially bigger, not just incrementally bigger. So they're great motivators. People love interacting with full-size horses and with miniature horses. Um, horses are wonderful mirrors of client behavior. It's one of the things that horses are second to none at. They are prey animals and we are predators because we've got the eyes on the front of our head. So if you approach a horse looking like a hungry mountain lion or say an angry teenager, looks really similar to a horse. <laughs> so one of the things that we'll do is we'll get the kids to go and uh, try and catch a horse. Going here, here's a horse in arena. 
go grab them. Here's the halter, here's the lead rope. And they'll go, and you know teenagers will storm off, and they're going to go get this horse. And the horse goes, oh my goodness, you're going to eat me, and runs. And so then it's a really good opportunity to talk about social skills, nonverbal skills, because a lot of these kids will go, well, why is no one my friend? I hate my life. No one's my friend, and no one will be friends with me. And you go, man, if, I, if you stormed up to me like that, I wouldn't want to be your friend either. But when you're working with the horse, it's not judgmental. The horse isn't turning them to saying, you're a jerk, you're stupid, you're wrong. Or even as a therapist saying, you're wrong in therapist ease of, maybe that's not the best way of doing it. They still hear it as being judgmental. The animal's just reacting. So it's one of those things that they can be really nice mirrors. If you act calm and relaxed around a horse, they're going to act calm and relaxed back. And then they're also great for physical and psychological and emotional therapy. They're used for both. So there are programs like the Little Bits Therapeutic <coughs> Riding Program where it's used for physical rehabilitation. And there are programs like in my practice where we use it for emotional therapy as well. So they're kind of a neat kind of dual thing there. Um, there's also fish. This is actually a new slide for anyone who's seen this presentation a few times. Um, we actually added fish in here because we found a study that showed that a fish tank can lower anxiety and stress as much as biofeedback can. It's a fairly instantaneous physiological response just by watching a fish tank, especially a saltwater tank. Um, and so it can provide a sense of ownership and caring for the fish. So if you have fish in your, um, in your organization or in your house, you know, the kid who gets to be in charge of feeding it or cleaning the tank or things like that. Um, however, when you're working with fish, there are some additional safety issues uh, that we'll talk about. Um, the difficulty is uh, some people say, oh, fish will be great because it's less work than like getting a cat or something to live at the facility. And you go, well, it's kind of like that if you left the window open by accident and the cat was dead the next morning. Fish are actually kind of difficult to not kill. So it's one of those things that you want to make sure you know what you're getting into before you go, hey, it'll only cost me 100 bucks to get a fish tank. Um, also, kids dumping things into the fish tank uh, can kill them really quickly as well, whereas generally it takes more than that to harm a therapy animal. Um, so then finally, we have dogs. Pippin, come here. Stop looking for hot dogs. Come on. Mm -hmm. Is there a kitty? Pippin. Hi. Yeah, there's no food. Come here, bud. So therapy dogs are absolutely the most popular choice. People love therapy dogs. They're cute. They're friendly. They give tons of unconditional love. Um, they have no shame. They're smart. They're friendly. They're cuddly. They're versatile. You can have, do active things with them. You can do passive things with them. And so it's just dogs give you a lot of variety. So they're absolutely the most popular animal to be used. And they also work really nicely. So are there any questions from anyone about the different kinds of therapy animals? OK, so. The next thing we're going to talk about is, is animal selection and therapy program selection. Because as we said, this is not a fix-all for everyone. And as you can see from the variety of different kinds of animals that can be used, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. So we're going to look at what types of clients are suitable, what kind of animals can you use, and also just overall assessing the situation. So in terms of what kinds of clients are suitable, um, a lot of times people go, oh, well, it's got to be an age-related thing. And it's not. We At the Glen Rose, we've worked with kids uh, under a year working on some of their physical goals. Uh, we've got some pretty big dogs there with some long hair that really like to have their hair pulled on and be snuggled by little kids. So we found that we've been able to do that. Um, there was a little girl at the Glen Rose who was having trouble walking. and It was mostly a motivation problem. And so we had a therapy dog go and work with her. Um, but the therapy dog would only walk if she was standing. The therapy dog was kind of weirded out by kids who crawled. So the therapy dog would stop any time she went to crawl. And we said, well, the therapy dog, you know, will only walk if you walk. And so she'd stand up and start walking. The therapy dog would go, and she'd go, oh, never mind, start crawling. The therapy dog, urge. Huh. It worked out really nicely, actually. So from toddler to adult to elderly, we've, our oldest client was 98 years old that we worked with uh, out at Alberta Hospital. So we've, we've done absolutely every age of clients. Um, we've worked with clients uh, who have mild to moderate to severe symptoms. We find that just overall symptomology is not a good indicator of whether or not you can participate in animal-assisted therapy. It's what kind of symptoms you have and if they present a danger to the animal. So you can be fairly severely compromised, but if it's not in a way that's going to harm the animal, then that's not a problem either. And then there are also many interest levels. Some people are really interested in really wanting to work with the dog, and that's really helpful. And some people are afraid of dogs. And we've worked with a lot of clients who have fears around dogs, and we've used it as a way to overcome your fears. 
because they want to be like the other kids, they want to play with the dog, they want to enjoy it, but you know, maybe they got attacked by a dog when they were younger. So we can work out what do you do to overcome a fear, whether you're afraid of you know, meeting new people or meeting a dog. So we work with those kinds of things. Um, some clients who are not appropriate or need some significant modifications to an animal-assisted therapy program, um, you need to make sure that they have good, solid motor skills. Um, and we're not talking that, you know, they need to be able to write their name or anything. Um, we learned this, uh, Pippin is a wonderful dog and is trained out the yin-yang for this sort of thing. Um, we learned this one uh, kind of the hard way. We were working with a client who had a spasmatic disorder. And so one of the problems was he was petting and one of his goals was open-handed petting because it felt nicer to pat with an open hand than a closed hand. So he was petting and it was going really nicely and then he was having so much fun it triggered a spasm and he went and got Pippin's ear in a spasm. And so I'm there with the hot dog going, good dog, good dog, good dog, good dog, good dog. And the therapist is, you know, unclawing the hand. And it was lucky because Pippin is an exceptional therapy dog, so he loves food so much as long as he's getting a hot dog. I mean, you could literally be doing anything to this dog. Right, buddy? Yeah, because you love hot dogs. Um, so you want to make sure that they have the motor control to make sure they're not going to injure the dog. If you're worried, if you're, one of the things is you're playing fetch, but you're worried that they may not have the motor control to not hit the dog with whatever they're throwing, make sure they're throwing something light and foamy. Um, even tennis balls thrown with enough force can, uh, can really be a therapy dog. So if you're concerned about that, definitely work with some of the lighter and some of the foam materials, so that's some of the modifications you can do. Um, if they have a history of serious animal abuse, um, that's not where you use general animal assisted therapy. There are specific programs that are made for clients who abuse animals, and it's not, well, we'll do animal therapy, and the goal will be to not want to be abusing animals anymore. It can't be that. It has to be a specific program. And to that point, actually, we had a therapy dog, not Pippin, but the, uh, we had a therapy dog in one of our programs, and uh, when you get involved in our programs, um, a questionnaire gets sent home, do you have a history of animal abuse, are you allergic to animals, and then a signature at the bottom to get consent. Got it back from the kid, absolutely fine, started him in the program. Working with a wonderful golden retriever that loved everybody. Um, so the kid came into the session and the golden retriever ran and hid behind his handler, which was really strange for this dog. And she said, oh no buddy, come on, come out, come out, it's okay, it's okay. And the dog was just terrified of this kid. This kid was going, come on puppy, I love puppies, isn't it fun, I love the puppies. And the dog was just freaking out at this kid. And the handler had to say, I'm sorry, I've got to leave because my dog is really not comfortable with this. And so the therapist is going, oh my goodness, this is like the worst thing ever. He was bringing the dog to work on the kid's social skills. And the dog won't have anything to do with the kid. So the therapist goes, oh, what am I going to do? So the therapist calls home the next night to say, I'm sorry, they won't be a part of the program because the therapy dog, you know, kind of freaked out. And the mom said, oh, that's really too bad. We were hoping that he'd learn that animals are fun and not for killing, like those other four dogs over the summer. So the mom had lied on the form, hoping that it would be helpful for the kid to learn that animals are good. But the therapy animal knew better. He knew something that the people didn't see. And so that's one of the things that we say for specific animal abuse, you want to get them into a specific animal abuse program. And then also, um, if the client has serious allergies with asthma, and we find that's the difference, is, is that clients with allergies we found have been able to manage through Benadryl or distance, um, some of those things. If it's allergies with asthma, then that's a significantly different condition and you want to take that a lot more seriously. We were working with one girl out at a, um, out at a residential facility and, uh, and the newspaper wanted to do a story about how great therapy cats were. This was with Rupert. And so, uh, and so the, little, the girl who was about 14, 15 said, you know what, I'll, I'll tell my story because you know I'm at a good place and I'm just getting ready to go home, so I'll tell my story and how much Rupert's helped me. So you know we're in there and the and reporters are doing the interview and she starts to tear up. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, let's stop. You know, is this okay? Are you still okay? And the girl said, no, it's okay. I'm just allergic to cats. And we went, you're like the star person for cat therapy. And she said, well, either I can take a Benadryl and be a bit teary and see Rupert or not. It's, it's really an easy decision for me. Um, we've also had clients that have decided, well, I'm going to play fetch, but they use those chuckets that hang onto the ball so they don't have to touch it. And they're happy with that level of interaction. If you're outside and just doing that, then that can work really nicely. So we find with allergies, sometimes you can find a unique fit. With asthma, that's got to be a little bit more serious. So then we're moving on. So we've, we've talked about the kinds of clients that are suitable. Now we're going to move on to talking about what kinds of animal are suitable. Um, it's really interesting because the different kinds of animals can be used for a lot of the same goals. 
So if you're talking about calming a kid who's got anxiety concerns, you can pet a dog, you can pet a cat, you can pet a horse, you can pet a rabbit, you can pet a guinea pig, you can pet a lizard if you like that kind of feeling. Um, so you can pet a lot of different kinds of animals and you'll get that same calming feeling. Uh, petting a tarantula, probably not, but... Um, and also if you're working in, on anger management, um, one of the things that's really cool about working with a variety of animals is they will all give you challenging behaviors, which is great to work with in therapy, whether it's a therapy dog that you go, well, let's get him to do a new trick that the dog doesn't know very well, or if it's in equine therapy and you're trying to catch a horse that doesn't really want to be caught. It's a really good opportunity to be involved with that kind of stuff. And then for people saying, well, you know, how useful are different kinds of animals, the next slide here, we talk about training. This is a goldfish that's trained to play soccer. If anyone's bored one day, type in YouTube gold, on YouTube, go to goldfish soccer. Um, this fish is trained to play soccer, he's trained to play basketball, he's trained to go through a hoop. And I think he's got, oh, football is the other sport he's trained to play. Um, so, and this fish has actually been trained the same, the exact same way you would train a dog to play soccer. So anyone who says, oh, well, you know, you can only use certain animals for training, you can only use dogs for something where you're training, because that's really the only acceptable animal. You can train a cat, you can train a dog, you can train a goldfish to swim through a hoop. So if you're looking at doing some training work, you can also work with, uh, with goldfish, it's not just the dogs. And Training a cat to do tricks is hysterical because they're actually usually pretty good at it and it's really funny to watch cats, you know, walking on leash and jumping through hoops and sitting and staying and down and rolling over. Um, so it's all possible. So now that we've talked about the clients, we've talked about the animals, let's talk about the situation. So what are the logistics, what kind of animals are available and what is your, you or your program willing to be responsible for? That's usually the biggest question. Um, so in terms of safety issues, we need to make sure that the clients can be responsible for their own behaviors. They need to be able to be able to work safely enough with the clients that it's going to work. Having said that, the degree of client control you need when working with a parakeet is a lot different than the degree of client control if you're working with, say, a 200-pound Newfoundland. Um, you know, that, with that Newfoundland, I'm pretty sure you would actually need a weapon to hurt that dog. Um, whereas a little parakeet, if you're doing this, go, yeah! That's it for the parakeet. So it's one of those things that you want to look at what level can the clients be responsible for their behavior. And also with a fish tank, I have known many programs who have started with fish tanks and they've had a client that's come and dumped something in the fish tank and killed all the fish because they were mad at one of the other kids. So it's one of those things that you've got to look at how responsible can your kids be for their behavior. Um, we had another program where what they did is they had a bird, but what they did is they double caged the bird. So the bird was inside a cage, but then inside a bigger cage that had a lock on it so the kids could interact with the bird but only when the, the therapist was there could the bird come out and interact with them but they couldn't shove anything like pencils in there or anything that would hurt the bird. So sometimes you just need to make some modifications. Um, a yeah, fish tank can become toxic if something's put in. Uh, in those cases, larger dogs, horses. One of my favorite stories about horse, equine assisted therapy actually. Okay, you can get down again. Thank you. One of my favorite stories about equine assisted therapy is that um, it was with a program in Scotland where they were working with gang kids who were taken in and they had been charged with gang crimes, but they were under 18, so it was a youth program. And these kids came in, they're so tough, and I'm gonna find your address and kill you when I'm done this, and oh, I'm just so tough and everything. And they had them work with Clydesdale horses, which are about 3,000 pounds a pop. So they had about these eight gang kids, and they let about 10 3,000-pound horses into the ring who were really excited to be there. So they come trotting in, and those kids, that facade dropped in an instant. Those kids were not going to try and be tough gang guys around 3,000-pound horses. So it was able to really work in their favor that they had those kind of horses to work with. Um, so uh, sometimes that there's a specific animal needed for a specific intervention. It's hard to work on a fitness goal with a goldfish. Can't really take it for a walk. Not, maybe put it in a bowl with a leash and walk the bowl. But uh, it would require a lot of creativity. Um, you can look at the animal's personality and the client's needs. Um, sometimes the therapy animal you have doesn't necessarily mesh with the problems the client has. If you have a kid that is dealing with anxiety and just needs some calming things, a border collie is probably not the right choice for that client because those dogs are so anxious that it's not really helpful. However, if you've got a kid with ADHD who needs to work on being calm and being focused, having that kid try and train the border collie to do something like a stay might be really beneficial. Um, and so is there a client preference? Some clients prefer different kinds of animals, some prefer cats, some won't go anywhere near a cat but they love a dog. 
So you look at that as well. So those are some of the factors you want to look at when you're deciding on animals and clients. So then we're on to the benefits. We're just going to quickly go over the benefits here. The ones that we found in our work have been increased motivation, reduced depression, reduced anxiety, increased communication, insight into behaviors, catalyst for conversations, incentive for therapy work, increased activity level, providing comfort, helping motor skills. If anyone has a lot of trouble sleeping, the Chimo Project actually has a research paper on the different benefits of animal assisted therapy. It's about 150 pages long. So, and it has insomnia, that'll just clear it right up. Um, and then the other benefits, one of my favorite, my honest to goodness favorite benefits of animal assisted therapy is being able to bring clients in and say, you know what, you've been working really hard in therapy, you've been doing a great job, today let's just play with the dog. And so they think, oh great, I'm just playing with the dog today. But you know that it's really animal assisted therapy and that can make a big difference in how well they do. Um, in terms of additional benefits, it can reduce stigma for treatment. Um, so instead of being that kid who has to be in the special class or is something wrong with them, they get to be the kid who gets to interact with the animals. Um, and also unconditional love. It's, it sounds kind of corny, but it's one of the biggest things we've seen coming back from our clients, that they really appreciate that because they usually never get that in their entire life. They have not gotten it anywhere else. They're not getting it from their parents. They're certainly not getting it from their friends. And also, like from their house managers, they go, oh, you only like me as long as I'm being good. Because, you know, you light the curtains on fire, you got to do something. You can't just let that behavior go. But the dogs are like, woohoo, it's a party. So it's that unconditional love that the dogs aren't, the dogs, the cats, they're not judging you based on what you're doing. They just like being around you. And then uh, we also have, oh, teachable moments. Yes, you can examine the behavior of the animal without being defensive or defensive of their own behavior when interacting with the animal. One of my favorite teachable moments is when working with kids uh, that have gotten into fights recently. If you bring them into a session and say, oh, I hear you got into a fight, the first thing is, it wasn't my fault, they did it first, it's not me, and you're really therapeutically not going to get anywhere when that's the starting position. When I'm working with the animals, what you do is you bring the kids in and you say, Pippin heard that you got in a fight and he was really worried about you. He wanted to know what happened. And the kids will actually tell the dog the truth because they don't feel like they have to explain themselves to the dog. So I'll say, well, this kid was being really mean, but then I got really frustrated and I did this. And then you can say, well, you know what? Pippin's been having trouble like that at the dog park too. He's been finding other dogs that he's not getting along with. Do you have any ideas on what Pippin could do? So then instead of you going, so what are you going to do next time, little Jimmy? You're saying, how can Pippin help with his behavior? Can you think of any good ideas to help this little guy make his life better? Pippin, what are you he's eating? Yeah, he's oh, Pippin. Come on. You found food, finally. That's his life. He loves finding it. So it's one of those things that they can, you get to be back on the table, um, that it can cause the clients to not be so defensive. Yes, there's a hot dog in here for the remote sites. Lie down. There we go. So the big five improvements, these are the, the five improvements that we've seen that are the biggest and the most consistent no matter what kind of group we're working with. We see decreases in anxiety. We see increases in participation. Um, we see increases in motivation. They will try harder and try longer in their sessions and show you the best of what they have when the animals are present. And it also increases social interactions and decreases depression. So uh, those, are, those are basically the things that we've seen that make an absolutely huge difference. Right, buddy? OK. Pippin's getting bored. Are you going to do something? Are you going to see? Oh, good boy. Dance. Dance. Oh, you're so good at that. So it's one of those things of going, the kids will show you their best. And your clients will show you your best when you're working with the animals. So I thought the pace of this was getting a little bit too exciting, so I thought I'd include some research. Um, I thought you guys needed some more help falling asleep, maybe increased coffee sales. So, uh, so here's some research. It's in your slides as well. We're just going to go quickly over it so we don't have anyone falling asleep and hitting their heads on the table. Um, through our demonstration project, we were able to show that clients with FASD who participated in animal assisted therapy showed significant improvements. Um, so this was animal assisted therapy and the program that they were in, but we were seeing 60% decreases in physical aggression. One of our rules is if aggression occurs in the group or the house, the animal goes home. So we've seen amazing decreases in physical aggression when the animal's there. 
not only from the clients controlling their own behavior, but we actually had one girl that two kids started a fight with each other. She turned around and said, stop it. I do not want to lose the therapy dog again because you two are fighting. So it was able to actually be a little bit of social control. It's actually a really good assertive moment for that girl as well because we had the therapy dog go over and say thank you. So 80% um, increases in life skills acquisition. 80% uh, increase in ability to cope with stress, 80% increase in improved emotional health, 60% increase in functioning outside the therapeutic environment. There's a big question. People go, well, great. They do awesome in therapy, but then what? And we've been able to see that it actually transfers over quite well. And in terms of some, uh, some peer-reviewed published research, uh, they found that um, so they did animal-assisted therapy with children with pervasive developmental disorders. And uh, um, so the kids were exposed to three conditions, a non-social toy, which was a stuff, um, which was a toy ball, a stuffed toy dog, and a live dog. In my old slides, I actually just fixed this one. It used to say a stuffed dog. And I said, here's Lassie, thunk. <laughs> Wouldn't really be helpful, but it's a stuffed toy dog and a live dog. Because a lot of people say, well, it's just that they're getting extra time. It's that they're getting extra therapy. It's not the animal. So they ran this study and found that the kids who were involved with uh, the live dog were more playful, more focused, and more aware of their social environments. And with serious, low-functioning, pervasive developmental disorders, that's a big difference. Um, another study in school found that when a therapy animal was present, the parents, school uh, counselors, and special education teachers noted they were less disruptive, formed better peer relationships, uh, improved communication skills, ability to cope, and their overall behavior improved. Um, another study found that having an animal in your office can pr improve the evaluation from your clients. Everyone thought, well, if I bring in my dog or do animal-assisted therapy, people will think I'm a quack. And that actually did a study and found that they actually see you as more professional and more approachable when you're working with a therapy animal. The professionals were also rated as significantly more competent if they worked with a therapy animal. And also they were perceived as being more trustworthy or worthy of disclosure by their patients. This one is important because if you're trying to deal with a kid in therapy and there's some underlying issue that they're not comfortable disclosing with you, if you can work with an animal, that disclosure rate can go up. And we've actually found that we've actually incorporated into our training warning the therapist when you start working with a therapy animal, get ready for disclosures. And every time we do that, we have... I was working with this kid with two years, nothing, 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 and then disclosed that her brother was being a problem at home. So it's one of those things that we've seen some pretty, some pretty interesting results as a result of that. So, yay, we're done the research and everyone looks like they're still awake. Good job. So in terms of the strategies, this is kind of the meat and potatoes of uh, what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so we have general strategies for clients with FASD. So this is what do you actually do with the animal? A lot of people go, okay, this sounds great. I'm excited. I've got the clients. I've got the animal. What do I do? So this is what this is. It's just a basic primer. Um, general strategies uh, that are good for any client working with FASD, uh, animal-assisted therapy or not, is short-term consequences related to their behavior, establishing achievable goals, providing skills training and role-playing, addressing issues of loss and grief, setting up for success and reducing isolation. Those are some of the things that with any FASD client you want to work on, and we're going to talk about how you can use animal-assisted therapy for each one of those. So the strategy, short-term consequences specifically related to the behavior. The strategy we train for that one is have clear rules of when the animal is present, such as no yelling, with immediate consequences, such as showing it scares the dog or having the dog go away. Um, with some clients, it's really funny, they don't care at all if it scares the therapists or the teachers or the other kids in their class. But if they see the therapy dog get scared when they yell, and, and the therapy dogs will be scared when kids start yelling, you just show them, oh, Pippin looks really scared. The kids will go, oh, I'm sorry, Pippin, I didn't mean to scare you, you poor little guy. You know, so they'll actually do some of those good behaviors. The other things I talked about is if the animal has to leave, you see a lot more personal control on the aggression front and from the social control as well. That's not a cookie. That's not a cookie. I starve him, apparently. He needs to eat the handouts for their fiber. Um, so if your goal is reducing uh, verbal outbursts, strategy, show that it scares the therapy dog. Hi. <laughs> He's trained to pick up garbage and give it to me. So I guess I'm getting a rating on my presentation. <laughs> Hi. Who's my guy? Oh, good boy. OK, lie down. Oh, he's got his eyes on the hot dog. He's like, is that what's going to give me the hot dog? Because that would be awesome. Um, also, we'll get to this one. When you're working with parenting, we have a lot of parents who only reinforce things when they're bad. 
Therapy dogs are great for that because the best way to make the behavior go away is don't reinforce it. So Pippin was just being really good by laying there quietly on the table. I didn't give him anything, so he went, how about I just pick up your paper and huck it? So it's, another nice, it's a nice teaching tool for parents as well. Right, buddy? Okay, I need my presentation. Thank you. Um, so another strategy, reducing isolation. We found that animal-assisted therapy is fantastic for reducing isolation. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. What a good helper. Okay, lie down. You just stay there. Good boy. Okay, sit. Are you going to say hi to everybody? Good boy. Say hi. Good. That's very nice. So now we get a little bit of an intermission thanks to Pippin. He goes, Mom, you're being really boring. I'm not getting to do anything. Will you sit pretty? Good boy. Lie down. Okay, we'll just wait. Perfect. Okay, so reducing isolation. So um, I'll take this, thank you. Um, so you have the client be the caretaker of the animal for the day. So you say, well, here's a therapy dog. You know, I've been really busy today, and I haven't had a chance to take him for a walk. Um, so would you mind taking him a walk for a walk before school? So the kids get to know the therapy dog, and as they're on that walk, the other kids are going to stop and ask them questions and say, oh, you've got the therapy dog. What's his name? What does he like to do? And so it provides an, operation, an opportunity for some really good social lubricant between the kids. Um, and it's also a better focal point. If you've got kids that have social anxiety, when people are coming to interact with you when you have a dog, it's all focused on the dog. I can't tell you how many people know of me as Pippin's mom because they really don't care who you are. They just want to know about the dog. So for kids who are dealing with social phobias, it's really handy because it diverts the attention. Pippin, stop surfing. Good boy, lie down. Good boy. So if the goal is to increase positive social interactions, you have the client get to know the animal and take them for a walk. So then we also have uh, addressing issues of grief and loss. Uh, have the client talk to the animal and have the client speak to the animal to address their needs. So if the goal is to process feelings associated with loss and grief, um, we, have, uh, we tell them the animal's story. Even a fairly plush puppy like Pippin was still taken away from his mom. He's never seen his mom again. He's never seen his brothers and sisters. He loves us very much and we're a good home, but we're not his mom and he never met his dad because he's a purebred dog. Um, so it's a good story and the kids are able to relate to that and then that, that makes them feel like they can open up. Uh, Rupert actually was the best for this ever. Uh, Rupert the cat, who is Natasha's, uh, grew up on the mean streets of East Vancouver. He was a street cat for his whole life. Um, you know, got in trouble, got his ears all ripped up with fights and other cats. So the cat rescue group came to rescue Rupert. And so they, they caught him and they rescued him and they put him into a foster home. And at this foster home they had a little kid and Rupert did not like this little kid. He didn't get along with him at all. So Rupert ran away. And so he was back on the streets of East Vancouver and then the cat rescue came and found him again and picked him up and put him in a different foster home. And in this foster home there were other cats and the other cats beat him up. So he ran away again to the streets of East Vancouver and then they caught him again and put him in what they call kitty lockdown, which is a 10 cat pen with two sets of locked doors on it that they use for the cats that run. And he just hated that, and so he would just sit in his little box by himself until Natasha came and rescued him and got to be a therapy cat. But that kind of story, it was really funny because we were doing our evaluations of that program, and we were asking kids, you know, if you like the therapy animal, what do you like about them? And one of the kids uh, we thought was really funny, they said, oh yeah, I love working with Rupert because he's got street cred. I was like, nice. <laughs> so the kids felt that Rupert was able to relate. So, you know, when Natasha pulls up in her little jet in her little suit to help the little kids, they'd be like, whatever. But they'd see Rupert and they'd be like, yeah, he knows. He knows what it's like to live on the street, so I can tell him these kind of things. Um, so if we're talking about providing skills training and role playing, uh, make the skills a fun game that they can play with the animal. So if we're talking about improving self-care skills, um, we can have the client practice self-care skills on the animal. You can play games like getting the dog dressed in the morning. Pippin's got about five outfits, some that would be appropriate for the day, like, you know, a t-shirt and shorts, and some that aren't, like a tuxedo. So it's a good opportunity for the kids to practice, well, you know, what outfit should Pippin pick? And they point at it, and Pippin goes and runs and grabs the outfit and brings it back to them, and they can get them all dressed up, and so, you know, they put the shirt on him and the pants on him, and they really enjoy it. Uh, another one is uh, brushing hair or brushing teeth every morning. So, you know, you get the therapy dog, you go, well, you get to brush their teeth, so make sure you brush the fronts and the sides and the other sides. Okay, now, different toothbrush. Important to have a pause there. Different toothbrush. Now, your teeth. 
Bet a therapist you didn't pause there and had to <laughs> stop the kid from brushing the teeth with a dog toothbrush. Um, but it's one of those things that it makes it something fun. Um, also, if you have a chance to work with, uh, there are some career transition service dogs that uh, didn't make it as service dogs. They know how to take off gloves, take off socks, take off jackets. And we worked with one program where it, um, the kids, one of the goals was to practice putting socks on. And so what would happen is they'd put the sock on and then the therapist would take it off or they would take it off and the kid would go, okay, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. But when the dog came, it became this great game of you put your sock on and then say, sock, and the dog would run up and grab the sock and pull it off your foot. And the kid would go again, 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 and then put the sock on, get the sock, and then pull it off. So this kid probably, I think the last count they did, the kid did it 45 times in one session before where they couldn't get them to do more than one. So if you make it into kind of that fun game or you put it on and then you take it off and put it on the dog and then put it on you and then put it on the dog, it can make it into a really fun game. So it's not so much therapy as entertainment. So for using role playing, you can practice the skills on the animal and watch the animal for feedback. So this is where we're talking about boundaries. One of the greatest ones that we can do with Pippin. Here, Gail, come here. So Gail, if, if you have problems with boundaries and you just let people in too much, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this hot dog to hold on to and stand right about here. Now, imagine you're, are you comfortable with that, Gail, or is he too close? Um, Say he's too close. too close. <laughs> so, so what would you do if someone was getting a little too close? Um, you want to talk to them? Can I push them away? Yep, there you go. You can let them know. Away. I've got boundaries. This is okay. And so, do people always listen the first time? Back. There we go. Oh, look, and then he sat back there. Good boy. Great job, Gail, with your new boundaries. So <coughs> that's one of the ones we use all the time. We'll give the kids, especially if you see a lot of times it's girls coming in and they have Zippo boundaries and no ability to reinforce them. You go, okay, well, I'm going to give you this hot dog, and Pippin promptly like gets in your face and on your lap. And you go, well, are you comfortable with that? And they go, you know what, I'm not. And they'll just push him away that, you know, I'm not going to dump you off the table, buddy. <laughs> you know, and you do that, and then the dog gets the idea and sits down. And so does he get it the first time? Does it always work out the first time? No, probably not. But if you're persistent about it, did I yell at him and throw him off the table and say, never come that close to me again? You can just quietly, no, I'm not comfortable with that. No, I'm not comfortable with that, and be assertive. So we found that we worked with a lot of clients that have been able to really reclaim a sense of positive assertiveness without feeling like they have to go way overboard with their newfound boundaries. So that's been a really good one. Pippin's great for that because he sees a hot dog and he's like, you have no boundaries, forget it. So that's one. Um, another one that's great with that is, is that Pippin's favorite toy is uh, this squeaky sheep. He loves it. Loves it, loves it, loves it. He will run and go fetch and think it's absolutely awesome, but he does not like this toy being inside of his boundaries. So we actually have kids, we say, here, play with the dog. If they can't recognize other people's boundaries, they'll take the toy, and every time they do this, here, buddy, come on, play with it. Play with it, Pippin, come on, play with it. Come on, why won't you play with your toy? And you can see in his body language, his ears go back, he kind of steps back, he's like, I'm not cool with this. And if you do this and constantly push it in his face, he's not going to get it. But if you go, Pippin, are you ready? Are you ready? Get your sheep. Get your sheep. Good boy. If he was on the floor, I'd throw it, and he'd run and get it, but it's tables, so I understand. So it's one of those things that if the kids are having trouble recognizing other people's boundaries, you can use something as simple as a toy, and to use that and go, okay, well, it looks like Pippin's not really comfortable with that, so why don't we try something a little different? Really good experiential therapy. You're such a good dog. You're such a good demonstrator. Thank you. Okay. Pippin, come. So then we also have uh, setting achievable goals. Um, one of the ones I love, lie down. You're doing good, but lie down. One of the ones I really like is making the animal the judge of the behavior. Um, with a lot of speech language pathologists I work with, a lot of the clients get kind of frustrated because you're always the one saying, it's not good enough, try again. It's not good enough, try again. It's not good enough, try again. And you're trying to be helpful because they do need to stretch that little bit further, but it's making them really frustrated when they're doing it. So what you do is you make the animal the judge. So one of the great ones is that Pippin can do a behavior, Pippin can roll over. Are you going to roll on this table? I doubt it. Um, but we'll see. Ready? I'm going to get your hot dogs. Um, Pippin is trained um, for speech language pathology work. And it was really easy because all you had to do was train him to roll on the sound of the R. So we'll see. Because if you say Pippin all over, or, you know, his kids will look all over, all over, if they're having trouble with their R's, he won't do anything. But if you say Pippin, roll, 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 
Roll! I know. Oh, it's scary. You gonna roll? Oh, you love those hot dogs. No. Okay, off. Good boy. Lie down. Forever down. Roll. 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 Roll over. That's just barking. Lie down. Roll over. There we go. So you can use him. He is now deciding what the R sound is good enough and what R sound is not good enough in order for the kid to get their goal. And so we find that really takes a load off the therapists. Um, being, also, you can do achievable goals. Oh, yeah, hop up. Hop up there, buddy. Um, achievable goals using role playing. So the animals are great incentives for interaction. They can provide good social skills and immediate feedback. So if the goal is to improve social skills and body language, have the clients practice nonverbal social skills and verbal social skills with the animal. That's, again, we're talking about boundaries, pushing, looking for the animal and seeing what are they saying, and then looking to you as well and seeing what you need. Um, we're talking about establish achievable goals using concrete feedback. They're great social lubricants. So one of the games we play, um, if we're working on turn taking, this is a good one. So if you've got a dog that likes food, or a cat that likes food, really. So Gail, if, uh, if I was working with one person, or especially two people who are having trouble with turn taking, you give one a pile of food. You're probably going to stand up and come to yeah. about okay. here. OK. So then what you do is you put the two kids across the room from each other. And Pippin comes when you say Pippin come. Pippin come. Cookies, hot dogs, come here. And so what the turn taking is, you, you give him the cookie, and then you say come. Pippin, come. Come. Oh, good boy. Pippin, come. And then he goes back and forth between the two people. Pippin, come. come. And this is really fun because then Pippin, come. Because then what the two people can do is they can then start working together, especially if you've got two kids that don't like each other a whole lot. Go. Pippin, come. And then come. they go, OK, well, let's put a jump in the middle. Let's go around the corner. Come on. Let's see. Let's see how far away we can get from each other. Go. Sit. Good boy. Pippin, come. And so if you don't let the dog go away, if you go, oh, well, I like having this dog here. If you don't let him go away, he can't come back. So you can't take a turn if you don't let him go. Go. Come on. And he won't do the fun things if you don't okay. let him go. Good boy. So that's where we really on. enjoy Pippin. Good boy. OK, good boy. Come on. Go hang out. So that's one of the ones where what we do is in order to get that turn-taking behavior, the dog is saying what is and what is not acceptable turn-taking behavior. We've had some really good luck with that. Oddly enough, with elderly clients at Alberta Hospital is the ones where we actually had some great luck with them who have trouble with their social skills. So that's what we're talking about turn-taking. We also have setting the client up for success. So if your goal is to have them follow instructions, you can provide instructions of how to play with the animals, such as the dog will run and get the ball if you put it on top of the desk or use the animal as an incentive following the instructions. Once you've completed the test, you can play with the cat. I've got two quick stories about this one. So um, we were working with a speech language pathologist, had a kid, they FASD, really low functioning. Wasn't sure if the low functioning was a result of um, an attitude problem in terms of the, the physical and mental abuse this kid had been suffering, or if it was a capacity problem, that there just wasn't the capacity there, and they had no idea because the kid wouldn't do any of the tests, wouldn't do any of the functioning things. So they had no clue which way to stream this kid. So they sent him to the speech language pathologist. Pippin, come on. Stop looking for cookies. Um, so we had the uh, Pippin, come on. Keep coming. Yeah, those are good shoes. Um, the, uh, so what we had the speech language pathologist do was, uh, come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Oh, good job. Back up on the table. Ugh. You can look for food up here. So we had the speech language pathologist do is she met with the client. And she said, um, do you like dogs? And the kid, and so brought the therapy dog in. The kids smiled and petted the dog. She said, OK, well, this dog's name is Splash, an awesome name for a speech language pathology dog. Um, so this dog's name is Splash, and he loves his ball. And she has a rubber ball. And she said, can you take Splash? And what Splash will do is she showed. She said, so you put the Splash's ball down, and then you do that, and Splash will go get it. And so she did that. The dog ran and got the ball and ran back. Kid, big smiles. And so she said, can you take that ball and go put it on top of the second desk in the row? Kid took the ball, second desk in the row, put it down and sent the dog, the dog went and got it. She said, oh, OK, can you put it under the, uh, the second desk back in the third row? Kid went and put it under the second desk back in the third row, sent the dog. She said, in that bookshelf, can you separate the red and the blue book and put the ball between the red and the blue book? Kid goes over, separates the books, put the balls in, sends the dog. She knows. That's pretty much clear diagnostic evidence that this kid just needs to be helped along from the stuff that he's been dealing with, but the capacities are all there. Um, in terms of a reward after the animals are finished, 
um, we were working with a, uh, a teacher in the States who, he's amazing because he has a class that has 10 kids that are all diagnosed ADHD under the age of 12. I don't know how he does it. Um, but what he did is at the beginning of the year, he rescues a cockatiel from, or a cock the little tiny ones, yeah, the cockatiels, um, rescues each of them, rescues one for each kid, puts them in the back of the room, the kids get to pick which one they want to have. The problem with almost all these birds is they're not hand tame. They don't like sitting on people's fingers. They don't like being petted. The only way you can hand tame a bird is you put seed in the middle of your hand, you put your hand in the cage, and you stand there perfectly still until the bird will come and eat the food. And you do this over a period of months, and it hand tames the bird. So what he does with his kids, his goal was um, when they were writing tests, as each kid would finish the test, they'd start running around, being destructive, playing with each other. So by about half the class was done, no one else could finish their test because the environment was so distracting. So what he did is when you finished your test, he'd check to make sure you made a good effort on it. Then he would give you a handful of bird seed and you would go and stand at your bird's cage and hold it and the bird would come closer and then bounce away. And the bird would come closer and then bounce away. And the bird would come and take a couple of pecks of food and then bounce away. And that would go on. And he actually sent me a picture where in the foreground there's one kid working on their test in the background there are nine ADHD kids under 12 standing perfectly stock still with their birds like that with the bird seed so it was an opportunity where interacting with the animals was a reward for good test taking behavior and it helped to achieve a goal of improving class the uh, noise level in the classroom so if we're talking on building on strengths clients are often good with animals so if you want to encourage nurturing empathetic behavior have the client uh, take it for walks, feed it, play with it, show it affection. This one's great for schools. If you have problems with kids sleeping in and poor attendance that's a result of the kid's motivation, what you do with that one is you say, you know what, the dog needs to be taken for a walk every morning before school and you get to do that. So the kid now has to be there early for school to take the dog for a walk. And we found that the attendance goes way up when they get to walk the dog in the morning. So another one is this that we talked about, build on good parenting skills. So if the goal is to improve parenting skills, one of the ones we love is to teach the dog to do something new. Sit. Good boy. And uh, such as sitting still in a chair. And so it, te um, it teaches and gives them a chance to practice the principles of things they need when they're working with their kids. Shaping, starting low and working your way up. Um, positive reinforcement. How do you actually do that if you have no idea? The difference between learning about a parenting theory and putting it into practice is night and day. Um, you also learn about appropriate punishments. When the therapy dog doesn't do what you want it to do, what is appropriate to do? Timeouts, uh, taking a break, not being angry, walking away. These are all good things to practice and celebrating success. So we've had some good luck providing insight to parents as well by working with the therapy dogs and training them to do new things. So another one, so if you want to participate in exercise and in balance, walk the dogs, improve range of motion, play fetch. We do lots of playing fetch and rehabilitation work. Um, improving self-care skills, brushing the cat, imp uh, improving mood, reducing anxiety, petting the animal. Animals are great for reducing test anxiety. Fire them on their lap while they're writing a test. We've seen the scores go up by a number of points just by doing that. Um, improving range of motion, speech skills, having the animal do tricks can be really helpful for that. And if you want to improve the classroom atmosphere, have the class be engaged by doing projects about the dog. There's more about that if you're interested in the uh, classroom presentation on animal assisted therapy. So now we're going to have an example, hopefully, of animal assisted therapy and what it can do. Zachary learned more than just social skills from working with a dog. He also improved on a basic fine motor skill he had been having trouble with for years cutting with scissors. With even the most specialized occupational therapy scissors, Zachary still resisted the activity. He would often have a tantrum as soon as he saw the paper and scissors on the table. Audrey, his occupational therapist, would often have to do the activity with Zachary, hand over hand, in order to get him to cut a somewhat straight line. Audrey came up with the idea of bringing in dog treats that Zachary could cut. The first time Audrey models treat cutting to Zachary, it's as if a light bulb went off in his head. He still had trouble holding the scissors, 
but he seemed motivated to continue the activity. It was the first time Audrey didn't need to do the activity hand over hand. In just two weeks, Zachary graduated to regular kindergarten scissors, something Audrey had been trying to get him to use for the better part of the past year. Both therapists believed Zachary was motivated to use the scissors because he saw there was a purpose to the activity, making Henry happy, which in turn made Zachary happy. You can see the joy on his face as he feeds Henry treats. We tested out this motivation theory by having Zachary cut dog treats and then immediately hand him a piece of paper to have him cut. Notice how right after cutting the dog treats, when he sees the piece of paper, he acts as if he has no idea what to do with the scissors. Even after the therapists model how to do it, Zachary still acts unmotivated. Then we give him a dog treat to cut. And he picks up the scissors and puts his fingers in the hole without any trouble. During post-testing, Zachary surprised us all. When handed a piece of paper and scissors, Zach cut without any problem and without any help from the therapists. So you can see from that video that Animal assisted therapy can make a difference above and beyond just those straight strategies we're talking about. And you can see the incredible effects that motivation can have when they're working with that kid cutting the dog treats. Um, and even when the client wasn't doing as well with the things such as cutting the dog treats, the difference in his demeanor and behavior from the beginning of the video where he was screaming and crying to not have to do the activity to going, oh, I still don't understand, but I'm going to smile and be happy about it. It can make incredible differences when you're working with clients. So I'm just going to quickly go over now uh, what the Chimo product is, what we do. Um, so we're an innovative nonprofit uh, organization that facilitates animal assisted therapy in the community. Basically, uh, we've done animal assisted therapy programs in enough places that we've got a couple good ideas about how to do it. Um, so we help facilities in the community implement programs and help to uh, maximize it right at the start and avoid the pitfalls that can end up ending a program. So what do we do? There's Pippin doing my taxes on his Excel spreadsheet. Um, we help facilities create animal assisted therapy programs at their sites. We help train therapists in animal assisted therapy and we also certify therapy animals. Um, we have a new in a box program which is basically a program for facilities um, to start animal assisted therapy using our proven methods. So we've done this a lot of times and we basically come in with policy and procedure templates, therapy templates, consent templates, waiver templates, strategy templates, trainings, uh, brochures, information sessions. We basically come in and get the program set up right from the get-go. Um, so the program can be tailored to individual program needs so it can have assistance with policy and procedure and research. Um, we train therapists or we also offer train the trainer we also create frameworks to obtain therapy animals and any other needs that are identified by the program. Um, some programs that have used our in-the-box option and really enjoyed it, uh, we work with the Elf Special Needs Society here in town and we had some really good luck with it. We work uh, actually in BC with the Central Okanagan Child Development Association that works with kids with pervasive developmental disabilities. That was our first in-the-box because we had to travel out to BC to start it so we really literally put it in a box. Um, we also done it with the Westlock Elementary School. We had some great luck working up there. And then we also have our affiliated programs. Um, so we're doing programs at Alberta Health Services 
Edmonton region, uh, that's a mouthful now, uh, at the Alberta Hospital and at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. And then uh, we have programs uh, with animal assisted therapy through the gracious support of uh, children and uh, Denise, really. But the, uh, we have uh, support from the government uh, to be able to run these programs at places like CASA, Elves, Bosco Homes, the Yellowhead Youth Center, the Family Center, Beachmont, Oak Hill Boys Ranch, Skill Society, TD Baker, and also independent school counselors. So a lot of people ask me, okay, I'm really excited. This seems great. I want to do this. How do I get started? And one of the basic things is that just come to us because we can help you uh, get an animal assisted therapy program going because there are some issues that you need to deal with. So some of these issues that, uh, that we can help with or that you're going to have to deal with when you start a program is uh, um, who can do animal assisted therapy? Um, will professionals need to be trained in animal assisted therapy or can they just wing it? Um, how will the animals be protected while they're working? How will the client or staff be protected from bites or scratches? How will clients be selected? Um, more areas include dealing with allergies and asthma. Will the therapy animals work in a specified area? Will they be allowed on the furniture? Will they put a sheet on the furniture? Who will clean the therapy room? How long between clients uh, when you have allergies? These are all the sorts of issues that we've dealt with before and that you'll need to deal with in the future. Uh, animal selection. It's possible to use therapist-owned animals, resident animals at the facility, staff-owned animals, or handlers from the community. Another program that's really interesting is therapy dogs can be transition service dogs from school. So if they don't like walking over puddles or something like that, uh, they can be placed as a therapy dog. Um, the Chimo Project now has a uh, partnership with Dogs with Wings, the Edmonton uh, service dog organization, that if you're a therapist and you're interested in getting a, uh, a therapy dog, that, uh, that you can uh, go and apply with them to get a ready-trained therapy dog that's trained for service work. Are you looking for cookies? Pippin, come on. So you can contact us if you're interested in that. Um, in terms of animal selection, uh, you need to provide for the safety of the staff and clients and it's recommended that no matter what type of animal you use, no matter what you're doing, um, that they, the animal should pass an obedience test, that they have some basic obedience skills, not looking for perfection, but just looking that they can be obedient. You need to do a temperament test. You need to make sure that they're okay with getting their ears pulled on, getting their fur pulled on, loud noises, sudden movements. These are some of the minimum requirements of therapy animals. You need to do a health screening. You need to make sure they're up on their vaccinations. They have no parasites, overall health. You basically need to make sure they don't have anything they want to share with us. Um, Information sessions are important uh, for everyone at the facility to know exactly what to expect from the program. This is one of the biggest ways in our programs that we prevent um, a backlash to the therapy program is we give people information before we come in. No, the therapy dog won't be wandering the halls. It's a certified animal. This is a specific strategic thing. And we find that assuaging a lot of those fears can go a long way towards a successful program. So in these sessions, we was recommended that the team have... Um, that you do them for staff, for management, for maintenance, for the client guardians as well because they'll want to know what's going on. Uh, letting them know about the benefits, what policies have been in place, addressing misconceptions, those sorts of things. For more information we also have our manual pause on purpose and I love this one. Its title is Implementing an Animal Assisted Therapy Program for Children and Youth Including Those with FASD and Developmental Dif Disabilities. Subtitle, A Manual Created from the Experience of the Chimo Project's Three-Year Demonstration Project and Ten Years of Experience in Implementing Animal Assisted Therapy Programs. Mm -hmm. Can you tell that title was written by a committee? <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's a manual title aside, or even including the title, it's just very, very, very descriptive. Um, it's a really nice manual for helping people get uh, those sorts of things sorted out and that was helped um, uh, with a three-year demonstrations project with Children's Services. So if you're interested in getting a copy of that, feel free to contact the Chimo Project and we can get you hooked up. Um, so how can you get involved? A lot of people finish these seminars going, okay, I want to get involved, what do I do? So if you're interested in the uh, in a box program, applying for a career transition therapy dog, uh, looking at service dogs, um, contact the Chimo Project. That's what we're here for. We're here to help. Uh, we can get you networked with other animal assisted therapy organizations, figure out what your needs are, and basically make it work for you. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about animal assisted therapy or starting your own program, give us a shout. We'd love to hear from you. It's, uh, it's a lot better than having to fill out statistics, so we enjoy hearing from new programs. So is there any questions about animal assisted therapy just briefly? Okay, well why don't we go to the big, the big questions. Sit. Pippin, are you going to say goodbye? Wave. Sit, wave. There's my boy. Good boy, wave. Good. Here, while you're waiting for questions, Pippin can entertain us. Come on.
what quality you should look for in a new animal, whether it's a puppy or an older kind of dog? Great. So the question was, if someone's looking for a new therapy animal, what can they do to help find the best therapy animal possible? And with us uh, at the Chino Project, at this moment, we have a volunteer coordinator that works with us uh, half time, and she's a professional dog trainer. And so she can help uh, figure out, do you want a puppy? Do you want an adult dog? Do you want something that's going to start in your program right away? Would you be a good fit for one of these career transitions dogs with dogs with wings that can you know, take socks off and coats off and all that kind of fun stuff? And basically what to look for. Going, are you looking at a puppy? Are you looking at an adult dog? What are the things that you should look for? Basically, in a therapy dog, what you're looking for is you want a dog that wants to work. So something that go, you know, you either at the SPCA or as a puppy, you go to and it goes, you know what, I want to work for you. You know, comes to the front, says hi, inquisitive about people. You need a dog that's not really shy. You need a dog that can deal with lots of different stimulus, especially if you're looking at bringing them into a therapy environment or a school. They need to be able to really roll with the punches, and that's something you can tell when they're quite young. And also you need to check for any of the basic aggression problems, food aggression, fear aggression. Can you give them a bowl of food and take it away, or are they going to freak out? You know, can you grab, you know, a little bit of skin and give it a little pull? Can you give them a little pinch and they're not going to turn around and <laughs> try and bite you? Because those are some of the things that you can fix them, but it'll take a long time, and it may not ever be in a suitable therapy dog. But if you check for some of those basic things, if, you know, I want to work with you, I want to work with people, and I've got, you know, a good basic temperament, I'm not scared of loud noises, and I'm not, you know, going to react badly if I get pinched or get my tail stepped on or something, then that's, that's a lot of the stuff that you're looking for. Yeah, and again, and the, the career transition dogs from, uh, from Dogs with Wings are fantastic because they're two years old, they're already trained, they sit, stay, down, come, heal, everything they need to do to be a service dog. They pull off socks, get pens, open doors, close doors. They're really fun to work with the kids because they're kind of almost like a cross between a dog and a person with their skills. Uh, you can also give them to kids to, take, to go on a walk and you don't have to worry about them pulling the kids down the street which sometimes is a concern with some other therapy dogs. Uh, so it's a really neat program, and it's a really good opportunity for anyone who's interested in getting a new therapy dog to get something that they can start working with right away, and it's going to have some really neat capacities to work with the kids. So I guess we'll open it up uh, for Lethbridge. Do you guys have any questions? Lethbridge. You have to unmute, unmute your mic. <laughs> Either way, I don't think that room's answering any questions. <laughs> How about High Level or Fort McMurray? You guys up there have any questions? Is there anybody there? I'm just talking to her <laughs> Anybody else out there in video land have questions? Gail, do you have any questions? Well, one thing that I uh, had to inquire about uh, when I started uh, using animal assisted therapy with my own dog was my how to get approval from my agency and what about actual liability. I mean, it's great to say my dog's not going to bite anyone or that kind of thing, but God forbid something happens, what, what do you do about liability, like insurance and that kind of thing? So the question here is about liability and insurance when you have an animal assisted therapy program and that's a very important question and something that you absolutely need to deal with before you start a program, not after the dog has bitten someone. Um, basically what it is is that we found there are two things. One, often the agency itself has an insurance policy and we found that with a lot of cases, as long as you're saying this is a certified therapy dog, this is not just a pet, this is a specific program, a lot of times we've had them for no charge add animal assisted therapy to the facility's rider entirely. We've had I think five facilities that have been able to do that where the insurance, you know, the insurance company is really worried about things bigger and that have more liability associated with them than, you know, a dog bite or a kid tripping over a dog or anything like that. So we found there's a good a good um, a good possibility that that will work. 
Another thing is, is that if that's not available, we've had um, some individuals like myself, I'm a reg provisionally registered psychologist, and I have my professional's insurance, and I looked around until I found a company to get my insurance through that would add animal-assisted therapy to it. And they actually added equine-assisted therapy as well for no charge. Um, so that's fantastic. And then sometimes if you don't have a professional association, like if you're a child and youth care worker that you can get insurance through, um, we've also found that some groups like the AMA will offer private insurance for things like that. So those are some of the areas that you can get liability coverage from. And one of the things we tried to do in government, it's, it's um, a tool of your trade, right? And so um, no different than Christine doing a psychological boundary on the kid, if those are her tools, right? And so we really tried to reframe it so that um, this innovative program is a way of reaching these kids no different than the traditional programs. And this is a tool that she needs, which is real, um, to help support that child. And that, that was quite challenging, but we got through. Yep, absolutely. And so what Denise was saying is, is that one of the things uh, that we tried to do is to make sure that people understand that animal-assisted therapy is no different from play therapy or any of the other modalities that you use. Um, you don't need to necessarily get separate insurance or pay more on your insurance rider if you're going to be working with crayons in art therapy because the kid might eat the crayon and choke on it. You don't necessarily need an additional rider for that. So that's been our preference. And just to be safe, we go, you know what, just get your insurance company to throw it on and then explain to them that it's the exact same way that, you know, if you do a psychological test and the kid freaks out and runs into the other room and runs into a door, you don't need insurance for the MMPI. So that's one of the things that we've been looking at as well. And that's been definitely beneficial, is going, this isn't some crazy wingnut out there treatment. This is another tool. And some days I may think Pippin's a tool, but, uh, <laughs> but he's just classified as a tool. Another issue that came up for us was um, with my dog, he was part of a group uh, therapy process for a while. And so we made sure to get consent for this kind of specifically for animal-assisted therapy from the guardians so that everyone can know what's going on and so I explained what, how the dog would be used and that kind of thing to the, to the guardians and made sure to get their consent as well. Yeah, and with some facilities, in terms of consent, that's another one of the things that we deal with quite commonly. Um, some programs will prefer to go on an as-needed basis, so per client have them f go home and have them fill out the consent with their guardians. Um, like if you're in a therapy group, have them fill out for that. And also with some facilities that have really jumped on board, like the Glenrose, they've actually added it to their entire policy. So when you sign up for care at the Glenrose, you say, I consent to participate in therapies, including but not limited to. And there's this list of physical therapy, occupational therapy, recreation therapy, art therapy, music therapy. Um, and they put animal-assisted therapy on there. So it just became something that anyone who works there has that. And there was a little box to check that would, that's essentially an opt-out box that says, I have allergies or do not want to my um, individual to participate in animal-assisted therapy. So it was just an opt-out section. And we found that worked really positively. Did you have a question there? Um, for, for clients obtaining the therapy, um, at the Chemo Project we don't do individual therapy at this time. Uh, we don't do providing for that. We're looking at doing that in the future absolutely because that's an area we've identified as need. Um, but what we do is we come in and then we work with programs and it's based on what you need. If you just need one person trained and a couple of quick easy documents, it's going to be a price that's much, much lower than if you're somewhere like the Glen Rose or Alberta Hospital and you want to have 75 uh, therapy dogs working with you. And that's actually at the Glen Rose. We have more than 60 therapy animals placed in Capital Health right now, or what used to be Capital Health, working at their facility. So obviously that's a much bigger and much different program in terms of costs. Uh, with them we also do ongoing trainings that about every two months we go to the facilities and do another training of another round of people. So that's again going to be a different cost associated than, you know, just a small startup. Uh, the question was, if you, have a if you have an animal at home that you're interested in having a therapy animal, what are the training options? 
Um, if you have a therapy dog specifically, we find that if you can get your dog through a basic obedience class at a reputable training facility or through an advanced training class through somewhere like PetSmart, generally if your dog doesn't show aggression towards you or anything else, isn't really fearful, and can pass obedience classes in your community, we find that's a great way to get set up for therapy work. And then if you're specifically interested in training them for specific things, like how do I get him used to pulling on his ear? Because, I mean, Pippin associates this with hot dogs, so I can pull on his ear till the cows come home because he gets cookies. Um, so there's some specific ways that, you know, not all dogs are born thinking it's awesome that you pull on their ears. So we do have some specific strategies for helping out with things like so that. Mostly just your training is mostly for the trainers then to get them. Yeah, the training that we do is for the therapist to get them kind of up to snuff. And then the training that the therapy dogs have, they need to get that in the community. And we find that works a lot better so that we're working with programs like in Westlock. They can go to their dog trainer and work with them rather than having to come down to Edmonton all the time. Dean, on behalf of the Cross Ministry Group, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, Pip and shake. We are very, very shake. supportive of what Good you guys boy. do. Good boy. It does have a great impact on kids with FASD in particular, as well as other children with disabilities. So thank you very much. Uh, just to note, uh, your evaluations will be emailed to you within the next two days, so please fill them out. Your feedback is really critical to keep these kind of uh, learning series going, particularly in the economic times we are. Of course, we are very resilient and uh, relentless. Um, the next session is tomorrow, actually, um, the 25th at 9 o'clock in the morning till 1045. It's with Willard Fuhr, and he's going to be talking about approaches to uh, treatment, including family therapy, specifically with FASD. So thank you very, very much for coming.